tonight's a special night for me. Tonight is August 31st, 2012, the one year anniversary of an event that changed my life. Uh, something very, very personal. I'll, uh, I'll let you see why this changed my life so much. This is my Springfield Armory XD45 service model 4 inch barrel. I paid for it myself. Sold a half ounce gold coin to get it. <clears throat> On the night of August 31st, 2011, I took this pistol, loaded up with Hornady Critical Defense, 45 Auto, 185 grain. These bullets right here, the flex tip, the really, really hardcore stuff. Took this pistol, which I had normally carried on me on my person as uh, just a self-defense thing that was that was a night that changed my stance on self-defense I loaded it up just to let you see I loaded the chamber safety's on right now full magazine holds 13 I got a phone call around 8.30 <clears throat> around 8.30 p.m. Just right before dark on August 31st, 2011. And the phone call really depressed me. I felt like I had betrayed myself and others and I felt like I had done something that I was just trying to really, really avoid. I was crying a lot for hours. I was very depressed. And I got to really thinking about the events. So I took this pistol, fully loaded it, took the safeties off just like I did right now. Three safeties. Grip safety, trigger safety, and lever safety. I sat here in this chair, right here in this spot, facing that direction, pointing this pistol right here at my face, just like I'm doing right now, looking down the barrel, looking at the riflings. My finger squeezing slightly on the trigger, enough to disengage all safeties like I am right now. Squeezing the trigger just enough to feel the grip and the texture. This pistol right now, just as it was exactly one year ago this night, almost to the very hour, it's 10.47 p.m. on the night of August 31st this exact hour this exact night one year ago I was sitting just like this but facing that direction with this pistol fully loaded as it is right now all safeties right now this very moment on this gun are completely off and if I pull the trigger much more further this gun will go off right now and kill me and that's exactly how it was one year ago around the 11 o'clock hour on August 31st 2011 except I was crying a whole lot and I was sitting there for several minutes thinking if I should pull that trigger or not 
thinking, maybe this is my destiny. Maybe this is what I should do. I should end my life so no woman, no female, would ever have to fear me or get all frustrated or bothered or feel that their safety is, is threatened somehow and, and that they wouldn't have to worry about me harassing them or causing any trouble or making them feel uncomfortable just if they happen to find out somehow that I was attracted to them or thought that they were a nice person and I'd like to spend my time with them or whatever like a like a date or I'm, I'm, I'm tired of this shit and I was on that night exactly one year ago to this very hour to this very night in 2011 right now is August 31st 2012 exactly one night or exactly one year ago recreating almost most of the conditions as of right now this pistol in my hand right now this moment that you're watching this video is completely live and I just have to squeeze down the trigger just a little bit more you can see this is up meaning that it's loaded you saw me load it Here's the ammunition. Primer is completely intact. High quality commercial defense grade ammunition. Right here. Now this sight is up on the sight ramp. Not this, what am I saying the sight ramp? The indicator. It's flat meaning it's unloaded it's up this thing is completely ready to fire and I put this thing up to my face because I was that depressed <clears throat> I felt my life had been a detriment I was crying a lot I was very depressed. That was, I mean, I've felt bad before, but that's like the worst. I was thinking about the time leading up to that, the events, the recent events at that time. And <clears throat> then I began thinking of further events, like more significant parts of my life for the last decade and a half maybe and I begin to think what's my life been about I mean it's just I sat there and I was very depressed and I wanted to die because I didn't want to risk being a sex offender or fucking stalker rapist fucking sexual harasser or whatever I'd get labeled as just because I was interested in dating a girl who I worked with who I thought had feelings for me because she was always nice to me I misinterpreted her you might ask yourself why did, Why would that motivate somebody to kill themselves? No, it's not being lonely. Now, as of 2012, loneliness, the perception of loneliness, is actually very welcomed, and I feel comfortable with it. you got to make your... you got to understand why a guy would feel comfortable with perceived solitude and it's because nobody's giving me shit nobody's bothering me <clears throat> I got so many hobbies I can't even pursue them all writing program code making music playing old video games drawing art 
fix in a computer if I wanted to. Just so many hobbies. <clears throat> and but I thought this girl was was a nice person. She is she was always nice to me, even when others wa wasn't. And I was attracted to her. Not just that, but I mean, even beyond. I mean, there's there's people that are there's other women who who I was attracted to, but this person it just she seemed like a good worker. She seemed like a nice person. I thought she's interested in me. I thought others were, you know, other people thought that too. I don't know. And apparently she wasn't. But she didn't make it clear. Of course, I didn't ask her out or anything like that. Oh, I sent her a message on Facebook, you know, saying that she, well, she shouldn't worry about if she's fat or whatever. It was, it was positive attention kind of stuff. You know, and just, well, there's a problem. There's what some people call a love triangle. I wasn't the only person who was interested in this girl. Her name was uh, Nicole Mead. That's this uh, girl that I'm talking about who um, I wanted to date, and that's pretty much it. <clears throat> but I tried not to be very obvious about it. I tried to keep that to myself, and I just got this problem with being too passive. And, well, she, um, had some lesbian lover or whatever that was like act was was very possessive and act like she owned Nicole and all that but <laughs> she couldn't be open about her sexuality because she was Jehovah's Witness and very forbidden by mommy to express <laughs> interest in such things and all that um, well supposedly a rumor got circulated uh, supposedly it got started by me. Uh, I don't see how it could be started by me because I was one of the last people to find out. Uh, two people had told me about it. <coughs> that was my former owner and then my friend Dylan who is the co-founder of uh, a couple organizations with me. Uh, he kind of got involved in this because he was interested in the same girl and then he got the people that came after me to try to get me fired from my job tried to do something similar to him. They tried to impose consequences on him. And he's this girl's age. I mean, this this girl was 19 years old. I didn't know she was that young. I mean, I didn't really ask and she didn't tell. Uh, but she was above the age of 18. And because she was 19 years old, I found out at the time. <coughs> And uh, she's actually a few months older than Dylan. Dylan wanted to date her and all that. And, uh, well, Master, you know, which is Victoria Ingram, uh, the, the lesbian um, that uh, was practically in a relationship with Nicole that kind of had to be kept secret because, you know, the consequences of, you know, the, the Jehovah's Witness Church and just being outcasted and all that. And, uh, well, Victoria and them, they found out that Dylan was interested in this girl, so they tried to impose consequences on him, but it didn't work very well, um, uh, because he didn't have a job to lose, or at least not there. Uh, but anyway, on the night of, um, August 31st, 2011, that's when Jennifer Ingram called and told me to stop pursuing Nicole and all that, and said that I had done something really really bad I got a horrible rumor started and I'm gonna have to and that, that I was gonna have to make uh, a public apology and it just and Jennifer made it sound like it was so horrible she exaggerated so bad and I felt so depressed because I felt like I had betrayed Nicole's trust the person who I admired and put up on a pedestal because I thought she was a good person. I thought she was worth my admiration. I found out later that she has like 
bad personality problems and <laughs> nobody really wants her. I mean, they, they, they're they physically attracted to her, but that's about it. Because uh, her personality's so bad and just... She's so fucking toxic. <clears throat> and I was ready to pull the trigger on this pistol. Like I'm squeezing it right now. You see that? You see that? All safeties. All safeties are disengaged. If I pull this trigger much farther, much further, this pistol will go off. And right now it'd shoot a hole in the ceiling. Still with my finger on the trigger gently, enough to feel the detail in it. I pointed this up to my face and looked down the barrel for at least five minutes, crying and sobbing, totally depressed and wanting to die. And do you know what stopped me? What stopped me from pulling the trigger? It was wondering what would happen to my son. Luckily, if anything did happen to me, even if in that car wreck or if I die from cancer there's the state to possibly take care of him so he wouldn't starve to death or whatever it wouldn't, might, may or may not be the best life for him but anyway and I was worried what my family would think I was actually I was actually more worried about my family getting depressed and upset I was I was more worried about that than it was my own life, because I was ready to pull the trigger. I, I felt like my future was just going to be a problem, and where women would feel uncomfortable, all this fucking shit. And I found out otherwise that that women actually like attention and all that. They just pretend that they don't for dignity purposes and to fucking play the victim and milk sympathy and all the other. Anyway, that was the night of the symbolic death. Because although I physically survived, as you can see me right now, although I physically survived, a part of me was dead. And that, was a, that, that began a wake-up call. And I felt like a woman can lead you on. And there's times where women will flirt with you until the point in which you become interested in them and then they'll betray your trust and then act like you're sexually harassing them or whatever it is that they seek fucking power off of and you'll feel like you want to fucking die because everybody hates you and thinks you're some kind of villain or whatever but after after thinking and worrying about what the consequences of my own death would cause maybe there would be infighting amongst I don't know because my family would probably be probably be very upset at Jennifer for escalating this and whatever so I put the gun down disarmed it. Then I went to the liquor store. <clears throat> and didn't, and uh, I did something I never really thought I would do. Which was I went down there and I was looking through the liquor there and uh, looking to get drunk actually just something to calm me down and I settled for a bottle of blueberry flavored Smirnoff vodka but when I was in there I was asking the store clerk what they recommend and I think they said vanilla or something like that I can't remember and if one of the people in there was this this girl like in her early 20s obviously she had to be above 21 to even just be inside the building so 
thin, she looked what I thought was attractive. Uh, she was chunky. <laughs> she was plus size. Yeah. She must have weighed at least 180 pounds, and she's only like around five foot tall. I mean, she was what the, the the physical type that I interpret to be attractive, according to my preference. I just glanced at her, and I just felt so fucking depressed. It's like, why is this person even even worth a, a second look? I mean, she's just scenery. Like. And if I try to do anything about my whole loneliness and all that, then somehow I'm a fucking predator. Because I want to hang around and socialize. I mean, the shit that feminism has done since, well, during my whole lifetime, and I'm 32 years old right now. People don't even know what goes on in here. They do not know where I've been. They don't know how things affect me to just be the most passive type. And I used to not even want to upset or aggravate people or whatever. I mean, sometimes I do. It inadvertently happens. We all do it. But somebody who cares... Basically, I don't want the world on my back I don't want to be the cause of a problem because I got a fucking conscience cursed with it for some reason. <clears throat> That's why I was prepared to die just so no girl could ever possibly feel infringed on or whatever. And. It just. I mean, people don't understand why I have so much frustration. The double standard they don't understand has woken me up. The double standard. That a girl can fucking flirt with me. Do all this shit. Oh, damn. Here, how about I just go um, find this on my computer. Oh, gosh. Where'd it go? Um... Yeah. I don't know where I can find it. Yeah, I'll show you an example of where they lead me on. You know what? I don't know if I got it in my pocket. But, uh... I thought I used to have it up on there. I, uh, there was a, um, love letter that was given to me well over 14 years ago. 
Where do I have it at? Oh, damn. Crap. I have the box and it'll take too long to go get it. Um. Some girl was basically saying what was clearly fucking like flirting. And, uh. Well, it. it well, I'll just get on to. I'll, I'll make that the point of another video uh, in the future. Because uh, I can't find this right now. But the aftermath of what had happened. The aftermath of what had happened um, was that um, immediately, immediately, I left Nicola alone. Um, starting with September 1st. 2011. I, I totally ignored her in the workplace. Wouldn't say anything. Wouldn't get around her. I, I'd totally avoid her wherever I was, whether it was in public or whatever. I'd try to stay. Basically, I treated it as if there was a restraining order against me so that there didn't have to be one. And anyway, uh, I avoided her for weeks. For weeks until a manager said they had to go teach her how to use a pallet jack. All that. I just immediately cut off any contact, whatever. Well, first I apologized, like I was told to do, and I told her, you know, on her Facebook wall, I'm deeply, deeply sorry, and all that. Um. Now, supposedly the rumor. I'm gonna check something really quick. Uh, 